David Kenny. I'm the preacher for the Wadsworth Church of Christ on Good Avenue here in town. We're very privileged today to have a guest speaker with us, Brother Phil Sanders. Uh, some of you possibly have seen Phil on his, his program, A Search of the Lord's Way, that comes out of Edmond, Oklahoma. Happens to be in town this week, and he has agreed to stop by and give us a chance to get to know him a little better. So hopefully you'll be able to catch him on his program. We'll put the slide up there with the times at the show that In Search of the Lord's Way uh, is shown here in town, uh, and also the website that's there. Uh, you can go onto their website and you can see past uh, episodes of the program. You can download lesson plans, uh, you request manuscripts, transcripts, all that is there. It's a great website, it's a great program. We're very glad to be a part of Search and that the Wadsworth community has the opportunity uh, to hear Phil on a regular basis. So Phil, we're really glad that you could be here with us today. Well, I'm so grateful, David, to be here. Why don't you tell, why don't you tell the people, you know, Search, you know, we see a TV show, mm -hmm. but could you give us a little bit of insight of just how big, uh, what a big operation it is to do something to the scale that Search is? Well, the Search program began in 1980 on one small uh, television station in Ada, Oklahoma, and it was designed to cover that part of the state but the quality of it was excellent and it began to grow and it moved to Oklahoma City. As time went by, they added here and added there in, in that part of the United States. But today, we are in all 210 television markets throughout the United States, all 50 states. Uh, we do broadcast in addition to the Inspiration Network, which goes to all of those places. We also uh, uh, broadcast uh, by, on broadca regular broadcast stations in 94 different markets. We're getting ready to add the CW Plus network. Uh, we'll start that at the first of the year, and that'll be an additional 109 markets. Uh, in addition to that, we're on in 50 radio stations. Um, and like we are here, uh, Time Warner does not carry the Inspiration Network, but we're on by the cable system. Well, there are about 150 communities, including places like Detroit and Phoenix that carry the search program uh, by this means. And uh, we put it all together, and then add what we do outside of the United States. We're on in all 50 states and 45 other countries and uh, go out to somewhere between three and 400 million people every week. Well, it's, really, it's really been a great uh, blessing to people all over the United States to be able to tune into the program. We have a lot of people that watch our programs. Maybe they're not able physically to get to church. Uh, so they bless, they're blessed to do that. And also you have some people that are confined. They're just not able. Uh, to make it. So it's really a great opportunity for people to uh, be a part and to be able to learn more about God's Word. Tell us a little bit, you know, if, if I recall right, search began with Mac Lyon. Is that correct? Can you tell us a little bit about Mac? Right. Mac is now 91 years old. He's still, still living and he still comes into our offices. He's no longer able to record. But he did begin the program in 1980 uh, when he was about 60 years old and has been with it all through these years. He's now the, uh, oh, I guess the executive uh, producer that we, we talk about as far as the search program is concerned. Uh, he has had many health problems in recent years, and so he's no longer able to record on the program, but he's still very much involved in our work. Okay. And uh, I'm thankful. He was my preacher for a long, long time. Yeah, we, uh, we would often run into, run into him at the uh, Free Hardeman lectureships mm -hmm. and get to talk to him. And always, you, know, you always come away after you talk to him be feeling very positive, uh, very uplifted. He's a very, uh, a very congenial person and very approachable, which is you know, so important when you talk to people about uh, the Bible that, you know, that, you, that you're approachable with people. You know, I noticed that uh, you know, you've written three books, uh, Let All the Earth Keep Silent, uh, adrift, uh, addressing postmodernism as it impacts the church, uh, and then also you just you just came out with a book from Gospel Advocate. Uh, tell us about that book and a little bit about it. What it's about? Well, it's called A Faith Built on Sand, and it's designed to talk about the emerging church movement and a lot of popular things. And really, what the book takes on more than anything is popular Christianity, which is very different from biblical Christianity. It's whatever people want, whatever people like, they kind of Christianize it and they call it church. Well, uh, it may appeal to a lot of people, but it is very different from what New Testament Christianity is all about. And that's what that book really is basically about, is the, I, I talk about the weaknesses of popular Christianity. Can you, you mentioned, we mentioned the word postmodernism. Can you, can you give people an idea? You know, a lot of people hear fancy terms. 
Uh, they may read about them and things that they're looking at. Could you give people a, basically a snapshot of what postmodernism is, number one? And then number two, how is postmodernism affecting uh, Christianity uh, mm -hmm. as a whole in our nation and, and elsewhere? Could you give people an idea what postmodernism is about and what it's doing to us? Defining postmodernism is kind of like trying to put toothpaste back in the tube. You, you might be successful a little bit, but you'll probably make a mess of it. Uh, Postmodernism is, is a commitment to a new way of thinking. It is a rejection of the principles and the assumptions of the modern way of thought. In other words, uh, because people cannot be uh, accurate in their thinking, uh, they rule out the idea that anyone's view is correct. Everybody is biased. There are no absolute truths. Everything is relative. And because they have bought into this, then there is no one view that they can say is right as opposed to every other view. So anytime somebody says, well, this view is the correct view, other people say, oh, no, you're being arrogant and mean. And so they're trying to, to put a stop to that kind of way. There are four trends that led to postmodern thinking. The first trend was the idea of secularization. That is, we're going to throw God out. We're not going to let God have the voice that he has had in times past. And of course, we're seeing our world today becoming very, very secular. Uh, you can no longer read or pray in the school systems. Uh, there are these groups that every time God's name is mentioned anywhere, they want to eradicate it from the surface of the earth. And, and, and it's a, the only thing that uh, has kept us alive, I guess, is the First Amendment and the freedom of speech that we have. But we cannot have anything that mixes government with, with uh, uh, God. And because of that, people have tried to move God out. Well, if you don't have a God, who becomes your God? People have made themselves God. This is what's called privatization. I'm going to make up my own religion. I'm going to do my own thing, be my own person. So this secularization, this privatization, and then that's joined with the idea of pluralism. Now, pluralism has the idea when it comes to theology that everybody's okay, that everybody's right, that whatever you believe, every belief is just as valid as every other belief. Of course, that's not true, but in a postmodern thought, no one can say that any belief is wrong. Well, then you add all of that, the idea of relativization, that is that there's no absolutes, and this is true not only in our theology, but also in our morals. So if you don't have any absolutes in morals and you don't have any absolutes in theology, then people can live any way they want to and they can believe anything they want to and nobody has a right to say that they're wrong. Now, now at first that might, that might sound like <clears throat> a good idea. You know, we live in a free society and, you know, and everybody, you know, we, ha we advertise it all the time. If you want to do it, do it. If it feels good, do it. But that's really short-sighted, isn't it? I mean, there, there's a trade-off for that kind of thinking in there. Well, it is self-defeating. Now, uh, whenever I have talked in times past to people who believed in this, I would say, okay, you don't think anything's wrong. How would you feel about somebody if they raped your mama? How, how would you feel if they kidnapped your daughter? You know, those things are happening quite frequently in our world today. You see, whenever people want to say sin is not so bad, it's usually they're talking about the sins they commit. But if the sin is committed against them, all of a sudden they're beginning to take a very different view. So the idea that there are no absolute morals falls flat on its face. Right. It can't really be sustained. And if it's true that there are no absolute morals, uh, I mean that there are absolute morals, that there are absolutes and the idea of relativization falls aside, it's also true about it in theology. Someone says, oh, there are no absolute truths. I remember my, my daughter coming home from high school back in the 90s saying, Daddy, one of my friends believes there are no absolutes. And I, I kind of smiled and looked at her and I said, well, does he expect to live forever? You know, nobody can fly into the sun and live. Trees only grow so tall. There are many absolutes. You, you, you uh, can only do things a certain way. You know, uh, Goliath may have been nine foot nine feet tall, but we don't have anybody 12 foot tall these days. We might find someone who's eight foot tall or a little taller this day and time, but we don't have anybody 12 foot tall. There are some limits to what we can do. There may be a little variability among people, 
But that doesn't mean that there's not a boundary beyond which no one can go. Now let me, let me ask you, one of the things that I've been reading about, I'm always interested in the way pop culture or some of this pseudo-religious type of thinking, the way that they're trying to present Jesus in a different way. You know, this postmodern uh, approach, it seems to be coming out in the way people look at Jesus. And people would be really shocked perhaps today, if they realize just how much Jesus would have rejected the idea of postmodernism. Jesus oh, was really an exclusivist, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, he was very much. And he was, uh, you know, the one thing that we hear is we can't afford to be dogmatic. But Jesus at times was dogmatic. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one, no one comes to the Father except by me. John 14, verse 6, the apostles said there's none other way unto, you know, to heaven except through him and through his name. Acts 4 and verse 12, there are some dogmatic things. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, speaking about his being the Messiah, the Son of God, you will die in your sins. Those are very dogmatic statements in our way of thinking. Uh, Jesus also was a person who believed in logic and the truth. Uh, the, the New Testament uses over a hundred words that are borrowed from logic. When you began to think about the number of words in the New Testament, a hundred and twenty some words have something to do with logic or reasoning or considering or thinking or examining something along that line. Uh, there's very much, postmodern thinking doesn't like logic because logic has conclusions and it sorts between things that are true and things that are error. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verses 31 and 2. That would have been an extremely offensive statement uh, to postmodernists today because they don't believe that the truth can be known, number one. And number two, they don't want to be in a situation where they have to go to one particular religious belief. To continue in my words means you stay with what I've taught. Well, they would never buy into that. Yeah, so it's, it, to me it's sort of ironic or paradoxical that uh, you know, they, they claim, a lot of these emerging church, postmodern type uh, mindsets, that they claim, well, we follow Jesus. We love Jesus. You know, we want to get rid of the church. We want to get rid of all these regulations or restrictions or whatever, and we're just going to follow the Lord. But that they're not really following Jesus, are they? No, they're, they're not, and you can't separate Jesus from the church. M Matthew chapter 16, verses 18, 19, Jesus is the builder of his church. Upon this rock I will build my church. Now that rock is not Peter. That rock is the belief that he is the, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23 talks about how Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You can see that close association there. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5 from about verse 23 on down to the end of the chapter, you have this wonderful um, illustration of how a husband and wife are like Jesus and his church. That Jesus is the head of the church and the church is his bride. All of those kinds of things. Uh, if we were to think about how Jesus looked at the church and someone criticizes the church, somebody mocks the church, somebody puts down the church. Well, I don't know about you, but I love my wife and I wouldn't put up with somebody slandering, mocking, or putting down my wife. And I doubt that Jesus puts up with people who put down the church as well. I'll tell you what, Phil. Um, someone asked a question. Uh, maybe you can give us a, an idea of this idea of pre-denominational Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that about? What's that term mean? Well, we have to go into a little bit of history in order to understand that. The phrase and the idea of denominations didn't really come along until after the Reformation. This would have been in the early 1500s. And then you begin to see various countries and various places all around begin to, uh, begin to establish their national church. 
England had one and, and Germany had one. The Lutherans came out of Germany and the Anglicans came out of England and there were the Scottish people and there were some in the Scandinavian countries and all of these particular people, you, they began to form these denominations that were uh, this brand of Christianity or that brand of Christianity. But the Christianity that's presented in the Bible uh, came about long before there were ever any denominations. So if we're talking about biblical Christianity, New Testament Christianity, the kind that came from Jesus, it came actually 1,500 years prior to any denomination. So the, the New Testament Christianity is pre-denominational. Now sometimes I, I hear people say, well, we belong to a non-denominational church. Well, a non-denominational church is one that's not associated with any denomination, but many non-denominational churches would not say that denominationalism is wrong. The church of the New Testament would be pre-denominational. It would not be non-denominational, it would be undenominational. That is, the concept of denominationalism would never have even been considered in Scripture. The whole idea that there could be this brand of Christian or that brand of Christian. Uh, the church at Corinth, you'll remember, some of them had their favorite preacher and it was Cephas and some thought Paul and some thought Apollos. And, and uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 10 to 13 really criticizes that church for going after various individuals or trying to put their brand on this kind of Christianity or that kind of Christianity. And he asks the question, has Christ been divided or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he says, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you lest somebody should be uh, saying that they were baptized in my name. The New Testament is not only undenominational and pre-denominational, really it is anti-denominational. In that passage, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, he wanted them to all agree to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. He wanted them all to be together. Jesus, you'll remember in John 17, prayed that his people, first he prayed, John 17 verse 17, that his people would be separated or sanctified by the truth, that is set apart by the truth and made holy by the truth. That's the first thing he prays, John 17 verse 17. And then verse 20 to 23, he prays that they might be unified, that they would be one, as Jesus said, even to the Father, as Father, you and I are one, that they may be one in us. He wanted them to be together. The idea of having this brand of Christian, that brand of Christian, some other brand of Christian, would have been very much outside the thinking of Jesus Christ. So, the church that Jesus built was undenominational, pre-denominational, and would be anti-denominational. I'll tell you what, in the, in the last few minutes, I wanted, you, you told us a story today, you spoke at a group of preachers today and over in Wadsworth, and you mentioned the names and you talked a story about uh, Will and Becky, and it was a very moving story, and I'd like for you to, if you don't mind, share it with our audience, to, just to reinforce just how important it is to be a part of the New Testament church and how precious that is. If yeah. you could, in the last few minutes we have, to share that with us. Will and Becky came into town and Will was very sick. He had contracted the disease consumption. In those days it was called consumption but today we would call it tuberculosis. That was before the days of penicillin and uh, Willie died in 1918 of tuberculosis. But in his last months they needed a place to stay and uh, they hunted for a place where they could be and, and they found that there were some rooms in an office building on the upper floors that they could live in if they would keep the building clean. So the family agreed to keep the building clean and they were allowed to stay there and of course they received a small stipend but there were four children and uh, three were up pretty good size and so a family of six would have been very hungry and it would take a lot of money to, to support them even in those days. So the family had hard, hard times Every day after school, the boys would come in, 14-year-old uh, Elmer and 12-year-old Oliver would come in and they would sweep the floors and take out the trash and do whatever was necessary for them to keep the building clean. Well, on that bottom floor, there was a bank there and there was a sweet young lady named Lillian, Lillian Flincham. And uh, she took a shine to the boys and she found out about the family's plight. 
And she would bring food to the family and to feed them and built a good relationship with them and showed them her love. Well, she asked one day to Willie, who of course was dying, would you like to have a preacher come and visit you? And there was a brother Taylor who came to visit and taught Willie and his two sons, Elmer and Oliver, and they were baptized. They were immersed in water for the remission of their sins, and the Lord added them to His church. Later on, Becky and the oldest daughter, Alice, were baptized, and in time, Glenn, the youngest daughter, would also be. Well, that story has always been very important to me because, you see, the, the, the little boy named Oliver, who was about 12 years old, is my daddy. And uh, uh, that's how he became a Christian back so many years ago and how my family was introduced to the Church of Christ. Of course, they, didn't, uh, they, they were shown a lot of love, but that was not the only reason they came to the church. My dad believed the truth and taught the truth, and I learned a great deal from him. And all of his life, he believed in preaching and teaching people the differences between what the world teaches and what God teaches in the book and why we didn't use instruments of music, why we immerse uh, for the remission of sins, why we have elders and deacons, and all of the things that make the church distinctive. And of course, all of those come out of Scripture and reading the Scripture and understanding what the Scripture says. So, uh, that story to me is very precious. When I get to heaven, I, I hope to see the majesty of God. I pray that I can come and say to Jesus, thank you, face to face. It'd be a great day. Uh, I hope to see the Holy Spirit. I, I hope to see my teachers and apostles and many others that I've read about. But after I've seen my family, I, I want to go find this lady, Lillian Flincham, who loved my people enough to tell them the truth of the Word of God. We really appreciate you sharing that story with us, Phil, and with our audience. And uh, please be sure to check out Phil's program, In Search of the Lord's Way. Phil has uh, dedicated his life to studying what God would have us to do and to teaching it to others. And if you have the opportunity to hear Phil, uh, please do so. And please remember the program here that broadcasts in Wadsworth. Thank you very much for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns, on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that, the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood. And only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. In this world we have our troubles. Satan scarcely must evade.